Hi students, this is Mrs. Foy, and this is a screencast about how muscles contract. So one of the things that you'll learn if you take um, another class on muscles or um, muscle physiology is that the only thing a muscle can do when it is stimulated is it gets shorter, it contracts. And muscles often work in antagonist pairs. So for example, here we have our bicep and our tricep. And um, this is actually a, a, a hinge joint here, and we can see that when the bicep contracts to decrease the, um, the angle here of the joint, the tricep has to relax. And when you extend your arm, when you extend your arm, the tricep contracts and the bicep relaxes. So muscles shorten, that's the only thing they know how to do. And so we're going to try to figure out how that happens. So in order for a muscle to respond by shortening, it has to receive an electrical stimulus from an action potential. And we've learned that an action potential is an electrical stimulus or a wave of electricity. And the only two type of excitable cells in the vertebrate body are neurons and muscle cells. And so these cells can conduct, they can carry or conduct an action potential. And so what happens is, is that a neuron is going to generate this action potential and it's going to spread that action potential to the muscles and the muscle is going to respond by shortening. So there are three different types of muscles, just to give you a little broad outline. Um, there are skeletal muscle, which is voluntary. This is the kind of muscle that we can voluntarily, um, by our cortex of our brain, decide that we want to move. Um, and we have two in involuntary types of muscle. We have cardiac muscle, that's specialized muscle that's in the heart. And we have involuntary muscle, which is muscle that is, um, like for smooth muscle, for example, that's in our um, lining of the uterus and the digestive system. And these two types of muscles are not controlled by our voluntary thought, um, but all muscles can contract in a, in a somewhat similar way, but we are going to focus our discussion today on skeletal muscle. So vertebrate skeletal muscle is, um, is characterized, the actual muscle itself is characterized by a bundle of these long fibers. A muscle fiber is a muscle cell, so it's the same thing. So when you hear of a muscle fiber, a muscle fiber, that is the same thing as a muscle cell, a muscle cell, same thing. And inside that muscle fiber, inside that cell, is a smaller bundle of things called myofibrils that are arranged longitudinally. We're going to see this prefix myo a lot, and that means muscle. So here's a great picture of the actual muscle itself. So here's a muscle. And um, we see that a muscle is actually a bundle of cells. Here is one cell. And you can see that a skeletal muscle is multinucleated. So it's got a lot of different, um, different nuclei that are in it. And this would have, uh, you know, organelles and, and all that other kind of stuff in that cell. But further inside the cell, and here's the plasma membrane that we um, have a special name for, which I'll tell you about later. But inside this cell, there are long strands of different two major types of proteins that are arranged in these little straw-like um, structures called myofibrils. So a myofibril is a... Um, a string of some uh, proteins that are arranged in very specific patterns. And as we see, that's when it's going to allow the muscle to contract. So there are two main types of um, myofilaments. Sorry, you're going to get sick of this myo. 
um, myofilaments in a myofibril in a muscle fiber or cell. Thin filaments, which are mostly made of a protein called actin. There is a regulatory protein on there we'll talk about in a minute, but mostly the thin is actin. And the thick filament is made of a protein called myosin. So we have thin and thick filaments, and they are arranged in kind of a, a zebra-like pattern that gives striated muscle or skeletal muscle, I guess I should say the striated is another name for skeletal muscle, which means striped. Actually, does look striped. So one of the reasons why it looks striped is because when you look down at the microscopic level, so this is a transition electron microscope picture that we're looking at right here, we can see the thick myofibrils of myosin. So here's myosin. And then we see these thinner, these thinner protein strands of actin. And we see that the actin is um, anchored to something called a Z-line. They're anchored on either side, and it makes this repeating unit called a sarcomere. And um, that sarcomere is going to be um, an important thing when we talk about how the muscle actually shortens. So, I think I said all this already, a sarcomere is just the functional unit of a, um, of a muscle, and that's the thing that we're going to see is going to get shortened. So you can look at the Z lines in the next picture and you'll see that it definitely gets shorter. So this is an all over picture, just a good little review. So we have our muscle here, and then we have a bundle of muscle fibers. Remember a fiber, fiber is a single muscle cell. So we have a multinucleated, we have a plasma membrane. Inside we have a myofibril, and we can see that the striped look, we can see that it's striated or striped, is because there are these repeating units of sarcomeres along the myofibril. And if we look even closer at the microscopic level, we can see that these are bands of protein, thick myosin. Uh, proteins and thin actin proteins that are anchored, the actins are anchored by these Z lines and in between two Z lines is a sarcomere. So this is one of the important models in physiology and it's called the sliding filament theory and that is the theory that we have of how muscles contract. There's an awful lot of evidence for it um, and uh, we keep adding to it as we find out more about how muscles work. So basically what's going to happen when a muscle shortens is the sarcomere is going to shorten. So here we see a relaxed muscle and you can see that the um, sarcomere is a certain length. When the muscle contracts the Z lines, the distance between the Z lines gets shortened and the sarcomere actually gets shortened. This produces tension, tension in the muscle as those um, thin and thick filaments um, pull together and get shorter and that's how the muscle contracts. We're going to go into a, a lot more detail about that so hold on to your seat. So one of the things that we're going to see is that the head of uh, the myosin uh, protein actually has these little um, pieces of protein that stick out that are almost like heads of a golf club. And they are arranged in kind of an angle. Um, and when the, when the muscle is at rest, they are not touching the actin. So here are the actin fibers up here in pink. But when the cross bridge is allowed to come into contact with the actin, it's going to pull it um, towards the center of the sarcomere. And these little cross bridges are going to actually ratchet that actin protein closer to the center, and that's going to shorten it. If this sounds like work, it is. Um, we need some ATPs. And uh, we use uh, glycolysis and aerobic respiration to generate the ATPs needed to allow these proteins to work. Um, of course, aerobic respiration gives me a lot more ATPs for my buck 
But muscles can work um, anaerobically. They can work um, through anaerobic respiration um, and just getting a few ATPs without oxygen for a short period of time. All right, here we go. We're going to get down to the, the uh, uh, molecular level here. So here we have our thin and thick filaments, right? This is our myosin, and the thin filament is our actin, and we're going to blow that up, and we can see that it looks like this. So when the thin filament can come into contact with the myosin, here are these golf club shape heads. It's got an ATP bonded to it. This is actually the low energy configuration. It's kind of cocked, but it's not ready to go yet. When these two can come into contact with each other, then ATP is going to be hydrolyzed and their myosin binding sites on the actin are going to be able to bond to this myosin cross bridge. When that happens, the cross bridge now is going to pull the actin toward the center of the sarcomere. It like, um, it's almost like a little ratchet motion. And there's lots of these. We're just showing one, but there's lots of these. So, as the myosin cross bridge touches the actin, it's going to pull that thin filament towards the center of the sarcomere, shortening the sarcomere. So what keeps the muscle from contracting all the time? It's only going to contract when it's stimulated by a motor neuron. So it should not surprise you that there are some regulatory proteins that are going to be involved. And one of them is called tropomyosin, and the other one is called troponin. Troponin and tropomyosin are going to be the ones that are going to regulate when the muscle contracts. So here's the deal. It turns out, as you look closer at an actin filament, there is a thin ribbon-like protein called tropomyosin that has a troponin complex of proteins on it. Um, there are some calcium binding sites on the troponin. Notice that the tropomyosin is covering up these um, cross-bridge binding sites on the actin. They're actually covered. So if that is the case, then the myosin can't attach to it and ratchet and make it, and make it shorter. But when calcium ions are present, calcium is going to bind to the troponin, which causes a conformational change of the protein, and it pulls the tropomyosin away from the actin binding sites where the myosin can bind. And so when calcium is present, these actin binding sites for the myosin are um, open and now those cross bridges can form with the actin. So when the calcium ion is high, that's when a muscle contraction um, is going to uh, begin. When the calcium is low, then the muscle contraction is going to stop because the troponin and the tropomyosin are going to cover the binding site so the, the, um, the myosin cross bridge can't uh, come into contact. So remember, the motor neurons, motor is the same thing as efferent. It's coming from the central nervous system out to an effector, and an effector is oftentimes a muscle. So these motor neurons are going to be sending an action potential that's going to synapse with the muscle fiber itself. So we've learned about how one motor neuron or how one neuron can synapse with another neuron. Now we're going to see how that neuron can synapse with an actual muscle fiber. So at the end of the axon of a muscle, uh, excuse me, of a motor neuron, so here's a motor neuron, there is a gap just like there is between two neurons. And we call this special kind of synapse a neuromuscular, a neuromuscular junction. So thank goodness it's named for exactly what it is. It's a small space in between a muscle 
a muscle, so this would be the muscle membrane, and the actual, actual end of the motor neuron. And just like we saw in um, neurons themselves, when the action potential comes down, and that's uh, depicted here as lightning, but as that electrical impulse comes down, it's going to release the vesicles of neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter are going to diffuse across the neuromuscular junction, the special synapse here, and it is going to bind to special receptors on the muscle. That is going to trigger an action potential on the muscle membrane. Um, and the most common neurotransmitter uh, at neuromuscular junctions by far is acetylcholine. So here's the basic overall picture here. All right, so here we've got a motor neuron. This is the terminal axon of a motor neuron. There would be a neuromuscular junction there. This is the um, membrane of the muscle fiber. This is the actual muscle fiber. And um, we call this muscle fiber a sarcolemma. Sarco also means muscle. So the sarcolemma is a fancy name for the plasma membrane of a muscle. So we have special names for these. You'll see this uh, prefix sarco in a minute. And um, what is going to happen is this action potential, so this is an action potential, is going to travel along the sarcolemma after the acetylcholine has been released and has chemically depolarized the muscle cell. So this action potential Poten uh, action potential is going to travel down and it hits these things called T-tubules. These are kind of like deep wells in the muscle fiber itself that allows the action potential to travel deep into the muscle fiber itself. And we're going to see a special type of endoplasmic reticulum called a sarcoplasmic, a sarcoplasmic reticulum. And just like the endoplasmic reticulum is a storage sac, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR, is carrying a bunch of calcium that has been pumped in there using some ATPs. So we're going to see that this action potential coming down releases some calcium ion, which jumps out into the place where the um, actin and the myosin are. And as we know, calcium is going to allow the cross bridges of the myosin to come in contact with the actin, and that is going to um, shorten the sarcomere. The muscle is going to shorten. So let's see if we can identify these. If you want to pause the video, I'm going to ask the question, then I'll tell you the answer. If you want to try it yourself, just pause. So what is this? What is this thing? You're right. This is the motor neuron. It is the axon or terminal axon of the motor neuron. And right here, this is going to be where the you've got it, this is the neuromuscular junction between a motor neuron and a, um, and a muscle fiber. What's this guy right here? You're right, that's called a T-tubule, and a T-tubule is a special well that goes down from the, um, the, the sarcolemma or the um, plasma lemma, the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. What's this? You're right. That is the functional unit of a muscle. That's called a sarcomere. What's this guy right here, that blue sac? What is it? You are correct. That is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, a special type of endoplasmic reticulum in a muscle cell, and that's going to store calcium. It's going to store calcium ion. Calcium ion is important, right? You're hearing a couple of different ways that it is used in physiology. What's number six? You're right. That's a myofibril. That's a myofibril. And number seven? Number seven is the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma or the muscle membrane um, on a muscle. So I think we've already talked about this. The major neurotransmitter at a neuromuscular junction is acetylcholine, and acetylcholine is going to depolarize the muscle cell, causing an action potential to occur on the muscle cell. 
And this is um, just a, a little bit bigger picture of what we went um, over before, but I'll go through it again just to make sure we're all on the same page. Action potential coming down the motor neuron. That is going to cause the vesicles at the terminal end of the motor neuron to coalesce with the end of the motor neuron. And the, it, the material, the um, uh, acetylcholine in this case, the major neurotransmitter is going to be dumped out into the synaptic cleft of the neuromuscular junction. The acetylcholine is going to diffuse across that space. It's going to bind with receptors on the membrane of the muscle itself, the muscle um, fiber membrane, and it is going to chemically depolarize the membrane, and that is going to set up an action potential that's going to travel down, whoops, it hits the T-tubule, goes down that deep well. As it passes by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the electricity is going to release calcium ions. Calcium ions come out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum where they have been carefully pumped in there to make a concentration gradient. And what's going to happen is those calcium ions are going to bind with the troponin, which pull away the ribbon-shaped tropomyosin from the actin so that the myosin crossbridge, the myosin crossbridge, that golf club thing, is going to be able to attach. And with the help of ATP, every time ATP is hydrolyzed, this muscle is going to change shape. We see that before, right? When something gets phosphorylated, it changes its shape. And that shape change is going to ratchet all of the actins closer and closer towards the center of the sarcomere, shortening the muscle. So I think I said all of this. This is good review for you. You can just read through this again and make sure you're good to go. Now, um, when you look at these motor neurons, so, so motor neurons, guys, are going to have their cell body in the central nervous system. Here we have in the spinal cord. And the axons are going to go out in bundles. And remember, a bundle of axons is a nerve. And we can see that each of these axons is going to innervate um, a certain number of muscle fibers. And um, there's something called recruitment, that if you have a very strong signal, you might have several of these motor units that are going to be activated and you're going to have more muscle fibers contracting. If it is just a, a small stimulus from the nervous system, you may only have one or two or three, a, a smaller number of motor units um, being activated and you would have a slighter contraction. This is a fantastic review of everything I've just talked about. Um, please go to the Mastering Biology website and watch this BioFlix on muscle contraction. It is excellent. So a couple of quick things um, that I wanted to talk about. Two very um, serious muscles disease. One is called ALS, um, formerly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And this unfortunate disease destroys motor neurons. Um, and you can see that if your, if your motor neuron was destroyed, then what would happen is your muscles would atrophy. And um, this is a, uh, a horrible disease um, where we do not have um, any treatment or cure for this. And um, people uh, are just going to lose all of their muscle control. And, um, and death is, um, is unfortunately the consequence of this disease. Another muscle disease that we know of is myasthenia gravis, and we know that this is an autoimmune disease that attacks acetylcholine receptors on the muscle fiber. So we can see that for some reason our immune system goes crazy and produces antibodies for the actual acetylcholine receptors on our muscle, um, our muscle cells. And so, unfortunately, um, what happens is is that these do not respond and, um, and muscle contraction does not occur as it should. We do have treatments, however, for these diseases, for this disease, which is great. So one of the things that I'm going to talk about very quickly is what happens when a muscle contraction stops. So when um, the acetylcholine, when the acetylcholine, so if I draw a, 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 a nerve 
um, axon here, and here's my muscle cell. So what's going to happen is that we know acetylcholine, as long as acetylcholine is there, it's going to cause an action potential on the muscle fiber itself. So we have acetylcholine esterase that is going to break down acetylcholine. That is going to stop the action potential from going down the cells. That is going to then allow the ATP pump um, to pump calcium ion back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that's going to go back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When that happens, calcium concentration is going to be low and so what's going to happen is it's not going to bind, there's not going to be enough to bind to the troponin tropomyosin. And so um, when that happens, the tropomyosin is going to cover the actin binding site. So the actin binding site is going to be covered. And when that is covered, what happens is the myosin cross bridges, the myosin cross bridges can no longer come into contact and so the muscle relaxes. So I hope this has been helpful for you, and I'll see you in class.